welcome to A Wee Bit of War, a podcast dedicated to telling you the stories of Northern Ireland during the Second World War. I'm your host, Scott Edgar, and in this episode, we're talking fashion on the ration with Rachel Sayers. Rachel is a historian with a passion for women's history and Irish dress of the 20th century. In recent episodes, we've been talking about women such as Emma Duffin, Doreen Bates, and Moya Woodside. Check out episodes four, five, and six if you missed those. This time around, we'll be focusing a little less on what the women are writing and more on what they're wearing. Rachel, welcome to the podcast. We are absolutely delighted to have you on. Thank um, you. you. You may be a, a new name and face to some of our listeners, although I'm sure you'll win over a few new fans on this episode. Um, for those who don't know, can you give us just a little introduction to yourself and uh, what drew you to this particular topic? Yeah, my name's Rachel Sayers. Um, I'm from Banbridge, County Down originally. I'm a young career dress historian and currently work at the Public Record Office in Northern Ireland in Belfast, but I've worked in Scotland and England in the different archives and museums predominantly on women's history, World War II history, women's services, country houses, sort of like 20th century women's history. I think I've been drawn to the subject because um, my grandmother was a young woman during the Second World War and I grew up with her stories of the GIs and the bombings and the blitz. She was in Dromore County down but they could see the Belfast blitz and they had to hide in the ditches because they didn't have any area shelters and then talking about the GIs in Dromore and then the Belgian soldiers in Ban Bridge and then all like the glamour and the rationing and make do and mend and my great aunts and sort of like that generation just talking about it. So I think the interest has been there since I was very young. And my first museum job was actually at the Northern Ireland War Memorial. So my interest just grew and grew into quite a quite a passion for Northern Irish women in the services. Well, like you, my uh, sort of fascination with the Second World War started with uh, with my grandmother. Um, mm-hmm. She uh, she also kind of grew, grew up just in that pre-war period. Um, mm-hmm. She she used to say uh, that uh, she worked in a, in a factory in Portadown in County mm-hmm. Armagh. Uh, she used to say that she made the bullets and my granddad fired them. Uh, so <laughs> that... That, that's yeah. what got us into uh, into the history. Um, mm-hmm. She was she was born in 1921, and around that time, fashion, like so many things, changed dramatically. You know, in, in that period following the Great War, mm-hmm. uh, particularly in in what became you know known as the Roaring Twenties. Uh, mm-hmm. Could you give us a, a little bit of an overview of just some of the major trends or or some of the things that were happening in that kind of fast movement interwar period? Yeah, it's if you kind of look at like fashion in 1921 versus 1901, you don't think there's like a 20 year difference. 1901 is the very corseted waist, like the big pompadour up to the Gibson girls style, very, you know, very restrictive. And then all of a sudden, 20 years later, you have maybe not as short as we think. The shortest timelines were in the mid 20s. And I think being in Northern Ireland, also a wee bit more conservative. Here we um, did embrace the shorter hemlines, the looser waist, and the women did wear corsets, but it was more to flatten the silhouette rather than anything, but it was elasticated so you could move. And obviously with the First World War, there was more women in work in munitions factories, nurses, services. And then obviously with the right to vote for 1918, it kind of sort of let the ball roll a lot faster than people had anticipated. So it was more women in work and obviously with fashion was reflected in that and the big trends would have been like Coco Chanel and the jumper dress you know something very easy to wear easy to wash for the working woman who may had a, had a family or live by herself um sportswear was huge also a very big trend trend in Egyptian Egypt Egyptomania after the finding Tutankhamun's tomb in 23 or 24 and then the Russian style was huge as well particularly in bridal wear if you look at probably I'm thinking like Princess Mary and then the Queen Mother when they got married, that sort of very Russian style dress. So it was all very like loose, loose flowing clothing, like you'd see in Downton Abbey, very easy to wear, but very beautifully made. And the style was there from upper classes right down to people like mine and your grannies, but only they might have been homemade, um, maybe not as elaborate, but still also the height sort of the 20s, 30s. The ready to wear, like sort of like just off the peg type clothes and um, going to the department stores in Belfast. So fashion was more 
accessible in the 30s. It became a little bit longer in the hemline, but big puff sleeves were fashionable. But still a lot of home dressmaking, make do and mend, sort of what we call make do and mend, but still very, very different from what the pre-World War I was. And it, it was more um so they're more accessible to people and it was more than people's price range to be fashionable and have good quality clothes like your Sunday best or your frock for going to the, the dancing and stuff. So it, it, it changed a lot slower than we're used to. But it, it when you look at the 20s and 30s, the fashion is is amazing and it just silhouette. It's 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 timeless. So, yeah, I think it, the fashion from there you could wear, wear today. And we've, we've touched on the fact there that the Great War and, and events across Europe and, you know, in Russia uh, and places like that sort of influenced fashion choices uh, in the United Kingdom and, and here where we are in, in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, by 1939, then the, the Second World War began, September 39, rationing came in into effect almost immediately and began to impact on people's daily lives. Um, mm -hmm. By the 1st of June, 1941, rationing in the United Kingdom also include clothing. Um, what, firstly, why why was this? Why was clothing rationed? And what was the overall impact of that on the fashions of the time? Hey, clothing was rationed because we relied on imports for fabric. Um, also, the fabric was probably going to be more likely used for, for, for the uniforms for the forces so it was restricted and obviously with the U-boat sinking shipments coming in from North America and obviously occupied Europe being completely cut off from imports rationing was brought in to make sure there was good quality clothing available for all people there was the clothing commodity scheme 1941 it was a set of mainly women's clothing designed by very famous designers like Digby Morton Norman Hartnell who went on to design the Queen's wedding dress they designed dresses and suits that you could go and buy on your with your coupons and they would last a long time as the years went on the coupons became less so you may have to have redone your your husband's suit who was at war you made a suit for yourself or your suit for your children and you lots of um you got lots of dressing gowns made out of like like what we would now call like it's like cross stitch and quilting you know made out of old bedding to make clothes um dressing gowns and clothing and parachute silk if you could get your hands on it would make a wedding dress but in Northern Ireland we're kind of in a unique kind of strange position because we had access to cross-border trade um, and they had rationing as well in 1942 because they obviously relied on imports from us but you could get a little bit more from America so there was a lot of cross-border trading there's um, in newspapers you hear of men smuggling stockings on their legs particularly teenage men because uh, they weren't suspected but they still had slim legs like women because they weren't suspected of smuggling stockings and um, I can think of a particular court case from Newry and a man was found smuggling stockings and when they came to do his testimony um, and count how many stock parts of stockings he had the judge said that there was um stockings missing but somehow the wives of the RUC officers had lots of lovely silk stockings so <laughs> where they went who knows but um there was a lot of cross-border going to Dublin and uh, Donegal town Drogheda for like if you could go and get clothing either rationing buying or by other means so we weren't as badly as affected as the UK mainland but I think the fashion then was still very utilitarian it's very straightforward not lots of embellishment no turn ups very small buttons no embroidery it's very plain but very very timeless you can see the silhouette coming back again after the war and um uh, I, i'm not sure how many of our listeners will be aware of this but um obviously uh, ireland and northern ireland had quite a large uh, linen industry um pre-war and during the war, I've, I've read all sorts of statistics, but it, it's a huge amount of uh, uniforms for the services were manufactured here. Um, is that something that we saw reflected in other fashions across the United Kingdom or were we sort of focused very much on, on, on uniforms for the forces? I, my partner's grandmother actually was one of those women. She worked in a factory that used to produce linen for clothing. Um, for everyday household linen um, and they produced linen I think for 
topical uniforms for the forces. So like in the Far East, like the women's topical dresses or like topical um, shorts and T-shirts for like Royal Navy and Army, you know, people who would have been in places like India and Sri Lanka. But they, she had worked in it before the war. And I think that the military style was definitely reflected in that sort of like sharp shouldered, very nipped in waist a lot. Of, if you could get a coat, it was definitely like a militarized coat. But I don't think we were as influenced or didn't produce as much as the UK mainland because I, I think people not very knowledgeable of our country. It's a very small country and it was very concentrated in areas. So we did have the, the output, but I don't think we had as much as possibly the, the mainland UK. Yeah, a lot of uh, sort of famous stories about the uh, the shirt factories up up around uh, Derry or London Derry, mm-hmm. um, producing a vast amount of uh, of stuff. Um, just what what we've sort of touched on uh, military uniforms there. And uh, last year, I was contacted by the descendants of uh, the Twist family. Um, and they had come across a story um, of that of Staff Sergeant Major Mabel Kathleen Twist. Uh, she was known as Kathleen. Uh, came across this story on our wartime NI website. Um, and in October 1941, the Chief Controller of the ATS, the Auxiliary, Auxiliary Territorial Service, Jean Knox, referred to her as the smartest girl in the ATS and really commended her uniform how it was pressed, how it was worn, um, the attention to detail on everything. And across the UK, women were donning these uniforms and enlisting in the services. What were some of these organisations that that women were finding themselves in and and what sort of uniforms would Ulster women have found themselves in? I I think I will go through them individually because I think there's so many. It kind of warrants a little bit more in depth because we, we had nearly all the women's services here, either people from Northern Ireland joining the services and being stationed in the UK mainland or further afield, or if they were from UK, England, Scotland or Wales, maybe also being stationed here. As uh, so we had the Women's Royal Naval Service, the Wrens, they predominantly worked on HMS Caroline and also in Derry, they wore a very traditional naval uniform, but interestingly, the stripes on their um, uniform wasn't, weren't gold, they were blue, because they thought if they were gold, it was too much like the men's uniforms, but their headquarters were also in Belfast Castle, and they also um, they used um, messages from, I believe, Bletchley Park, written shipping and intelligence. We also had um, obviously the ATS, the Auxiliary Ter- Territorial Service with Kathleen Twist. They were stationed all over anywhere there was an army base. The Women's Auxiliary Air Force, which is another another mouth, mouthful, the WAF. They were stationed predominantly at Aldergrove and Elgin and then also smaller air bases. But interestingly enough, we also had our own version of the Women's Land Army. Other women from here joined the Women's Land Army and went to the UK, the mainland UK, or they were part of well, I've researched the Ulster Women's Land Army. Now, they had the same uniform as the Women's Land Army. They had the breeches and the gaiters and the green jumper and the really famous sort of tilted hat. But they were under the auxiliary of the Ministry of Agriculture, but they had the same pay structure as the Women's Land Army. But it's finding out information, not only in the Women's Land Army, but on the various services here. It's it's very hard. It's quite big, kind of trying to pinpoint when they kind of started either people joined off their own bat or they joined a MV regiment that was in England and they were stationed here. But the Women's Land Army is probably the hardest to find any information on. They definitely existed because they trained at Lockery College uh, in Cookstown and Greenmount College as well. But I have been unable to find any names for anybody who joined the Ulster Women's Land Army. And by extension, trying to find names like people like Kathleen twist it's very very difficult it's a matter of like people contacting you or talking to people about their family you know it's a very piecemeal sort of situation but they all had beautiful turned out uniforms you know polished shoes no hemlines and um, ragged uh, buttons polished you know they were absolutely immaculate they really sort of a uh, flew the flag for Ulster womanhood at a very very 
difficult period. And we also had the Women's Voluntary Service for Civil Defence, and they were predominantly housewives, sort of working class to upper middle class women who didn't join the service for, for a reason. And they had a like a linen, talking about linen, like a linen dress or coat, depending on the time of year and a hat. And they were prominently a they were prominently in charge of like evacuees. They were massive in the Belfast Blitz, helping people find accommodation, providing food, you know, um, telling people about their loved ones if they'd killed or they were injured. Um, and then they had clothing drives, they had mobile canteens, they needed comforts for the troops. So they were really like on the ground day to day, sort of on the home front. So we had a, across Ulster, we had a very great plethora of women who were doing so many amazing, wonderful things. And unfortunately, not many, not many people know about them. Well, we have uh, certainly been been sharing some of the stories of some of those women, mm-hmm. and and when this podcast goes out, we'll we'll put a few photos up on our social media um, of uh, of some of those women who served in the Rands, in mm-hmm. the WAF, and in the ATS. Uh, mm-hmm. But but like yourself, um, the Ulster Women's Land Army is is something that's relatively unheard of uh, to me. Um, you know, it it comes up every now and again, and and I remember it was a thing, but trying to find information about that is is nigh on impossible so if anyone's listening out there and, and has any stories about uh, the land army in ulster i uh, would like to get in touch with either me or rachel uh, i would say please feel free to do so because we would love to hear more that would be great i've actually coined it myself it's the ulster Women's land army because there wasn't really an official sort of information because i know that women from both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland did join the, the Women's Land Army, but in England and Wales and Scotland, but a lot of their records are in queue in London. I just, I haven't had the time to go and look at their records, but yes, if anybody could get in touch with information about either Ulster Women's Land Army or women in the women in the Land Army, and they would be great, because as you say, it's very hard to find information. There is information in the public record office where I work, but it's very, very, very little, very little. And so we, we do rely on uh, on sometimes on people like uh, the those members of the Twist family who uh, got in touch. Um, they, they actually got in touch because they'd seen photos on the website that they'd never come across before um, of Kathleen and her husband who only met up once during the war. Um, they, they were both on leave at exactly the same time. And it's a very famous uh, photo of them both in their immaculate uniforms, uh, having a kiss, I believe, in uh, a barracks in Lisburn. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're great photos. And uh, we've, we've several others up on the website of, of women in different services. So we'll, we'll share those when this uh, episode goes out. Um, 1942, um, as people who've listened to earlier episodes of this podcast will by now know, brought the Americans to Northern Ireland. Uh, Famously, they brought with them uh, nylons for the ladies and sort of in general, a keener sense of fashion than than rural Ireland had perhaps seen before. Um, Also, newspaper articles at the time made quite a deal of some of the American nurses uh, wearing slacks on board the ships. Um, What was the the sort of overall impact of the arrival of the Americans here or um, how did just American, um, an American presence in the United Kingdom even change kind of ideas and, and that surrounding fashion? Yeah, well, I'll start off with a story that my my nanny told me about the NI, the GIs in Northern Ireland. And it's a funny story because my, my, my grandmother, she lived till she was 97 and she was a very religious Ulster woman, as she referred to herself, very proud church going woman. But she was in Dromora County Down and there was two or three American battalions stationed near her. And they lived in a row of terrace houses and she had two American boyfriends. So on the on the like it was all very, very innocent compared to what we would think today. But on a Friday night, she would go with one in the afternoon for tea and she would go home and he'd give her stockings and red lipstick for all her many sisters. And then she'd get changed and go out the back alleyway that would connect the houses and into her aunt's house at the very bottom. And another GI from another battalion would take her out. But her aunt pretended to be her mother because her aunt didn't have any children, any female children. And again, she came home, said goodnight and got more stockings and red lipstick for the family. So 
that's just one story of how the Americans sort of changed some Austro- uh, Northern Irish woman's life. But right. In, innocent times, and I'm, I'm sure there are uh, hundreds of those stories across uh, the whole of Ulster. Yeah, yeah. I, I never forget when she told me, she was 90 when she told me, and I just couldn't believe it. my lovely little, my nanny. I just couldn't believe it, but it's just sort of those stories you hear from relatives and friends, how the GI sort of brought a glamour to war, if that's the way to say it, because obviously at this stage, Cary Grant a uh, Jimmy Stewart, all the big names and the stars, you know, Rita Hayworth, um, Marlena Dietrich, you know, we went to, even though we're quite conservative in Northern Ireland, they still went to the pictures on the Friday or Saturday night. So I think they had this like glamorization of the GIs because obviously they were better paid and better dressed. And obviously a lot of them were very, very good looking. So I think they brought like the, the glamour and the wonder of this country that they only really knew through pictures as in moving pictures. And I think they brought sort of not a relaxation out in our conservative sort of way of life, but a more relaxed way of thinking about things, you know, more relaxed way of talking to people and socializing. And I definitely remember my grandmother saying that towards the end of the war, her and her my great aunts wore slacks, much to the deride, deridement of some of the older members of society in Dremore. So there definitely was that like ongoing effect of sort of not so we wouldn't really see it as casualization now, but definitely from what it was, they definitely were more free and easygoing. And my granny remembers definitely going to the, the dance halls. And then in the first month they were in stockings and very formal, but by then they were wearing maybe like hey, sandals and socks and maybe shorts, you know, very, very free and easy and going. And they said they all had impeccable, impeccable manners, lovely people. But I said on the flip side, a lot of, girls would have used the nicer GIs just to get all the nylons and chocolate and stuff so there was the the negative side and there is other stories that people talk about but I think by the time they'd left in 44 45 I think with the definitely changed Ulster society hopefully for the best and then obviously the many GI brides that went to America as well yeah they, they certainly left a lasting uh, impact um mm-hmm. the, the fact that we're here um 80 something years later and, and still telling those stories of of the americans time here um mm-hmm. i think i think proves that mm-hmm. um so like i said we're we're decades and decades on from the end of the second world war um it is not that uncommon now to see maybe a fashionable headscarf, hair up in victory rolls, vintage dresses. Uh, Rachel, I know you yourself are par- partial to uh, sporting a beret. Yeah. Um, why Why do you think some of these iconic looks of the 40s and, and maybe early 50s remain so popular today? Yeah, as you said, I, have, I never met a beret I do not like because most of them are my grandmothers. And I think I was, as you say, in Northern Ireland, you know, you were, I was reared by my, my granny in that generation. And I think I grew up with that idea of not necessarily Hollywood glamour, but just being sort of presentable in everyday life. You know, hair groomed, but, you know, your your clothes look good. You look good. You give people a good impression. You don't have to spend a lot of money to look good, good tailored clothes. And I think because of the last, like, Hollywood era, like Marilyn Monroe, Ray the hair with that sort of, like, bygone glamour like they looked immaculate like my grandmother looked immaculate just going to the shop with a red like red lipstick and like she said the headscarf but she might have had the 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 victory rolls of the rollers in you know for the the dance in the evenings so i think because fashion has changed so much between now and then it's more casual and um maybe less formal people kind of hark back maybe nostalgically maybe you know not per- maybe really even what the big picture is to like a simpler time but beautifully made clothes because a lot of clothes now aren't as well made there's a reason why 40s and 50s dresses have lasted the test of time in 100 years are you going to be wearing vintage pre-mark i don't think so you're going to still be looking for like good quality clothing and i think from my own personal point of view i think that sort of style just suits certain people i just love dressing up in vintage clothing you just sort of feel like you're putting on a part of history and I think that sort of timeless red lipstick, fifty rolls, berets, trench coats. The way when I wear a trench coat, I would think that I look glamorous, but I look like um, is it Michelle from a low low? So I look like a member 
of the French resistance or an evacuee. Unfortunately, I, I don't get to look like Rita Hayworth, but I just roll, roll with it. So I think that sort of style just sort of keeps coming back today over and over again because it's timeless. And I think it always will be timeless. I think that's possibly uh, sporting the trench coat and the beret at the same time. I think possibly gives you that uh, French resistance look. I guess I also am part of the satchels and brown brogues. So I, I yeah, I, um, it's it's um, yeah, it's probably my own fault. But I, I have had a friend in the past has played a joke on me and put a little brown navel on my satchel, so I look like an evacuee. So I think that style sort of, if you're going to go with it, you might as well go with the whole hog. That's why I believe anyway. And uh, outside of what we've been talking about here and outside of the, the items that you would uh, wear, is there is there anything from that era that you would like to see brought back to the fore in today's fashion? Um, I think probably, I'm trying to think, I think silk stockings because they just look amazing. I know they're, they're my own, I have had experience wearing them before. They're very hard to keep straight because my nanny said, when you're your friends, the thing you always ask your friends, it was my seams straight because obviously they could get get crooked. And I think just sort of, and I don't have to be formal every day, but maybe a more, you know, like tailored way of looking, you know, particularly with menswear, you know, like maybe more suits and stuff. And just think, you know, like a nice coat and hat goes a, goes a long way or, a, yeah, just sort of nice, nice clothes. So I can't pinpoint anything in particular, but maybe something like a tailored suit. I think that would, that would be nice to bring back. Uh, hard, hard to go wrong in uh, in a good suit or uh, a nicely tailored dress. Um, yeah, that's true. Um, so we've covered a lot in this. Um, are there are there any? We I, I know you had maybe some personal stories or um, stories of of some of those women who served um, outside of their immaculate uniforms there was much more to these people mm -hmm. um than than simply what they looked like or what they wore have mm -hmm. you one story in particular um that you would like to share with us or or anything more even even from your grandmother yeah i think really my as i said my my grandmother didn't serve um she came she was from a large family and she was the oldest girl so she was a, a, a breadwinner but i remember her telling me that she was with my great grandmother and they were out for a walk one day and they came across a serviceman and he was in distress and they brought him home and they looked after him and it turned out he was a deserter because he he had joined a regiment I think he was English and I don't know where he deserted from but he was he obviously was suffering from shell shock but they had to tell the local RUC officer because they would be liable for a fine and imprisonment and I think he cried for his mother and that it, beyond the uniforms all the glamour is something that's kind of like the reality of war has always stayed with me. And then my grandmother said when they found out about concentration camps, you know, they just couldn't believe it. So, you know, despite all the glamour and all the amazing service I've just talked about, you know, the, the reality of it did hit home quite a lot. But talking of one particular woman. I worked on HMS Caroline. We did an oral history project about six years ago, and we had two World War II wrens, and one was from Bangor, and she and another wren were in a little hut, and they had their slacks and their uniform on. But part of their job was to relay messages from Bletchley Park through different communications through Wales and England and Scotland, and they sent it on to HMS Caroline, and then her friend was in HMS Caroline, who was, I think, unfortunately passed away, passed it on to Belfast Castle. So I thought that was very interesting because everybody knows about Bletchley Park, but they did have a connection, Bletchley and Belfast. That's a fascinating story and, and a good reminder there as well that, you know, we, we often look back maybe with a little too much nostalgia or, or, or rose-tinted glasses, mm -hmm. and it, it was genuinely a very tough time to be alive, a, a very kind of emotional time, mm -hmm. Uh, no matter where you were in, in Europe or even across the world. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, maybe for, for these women and, and men as well, dressing up, having a little bit of glamour, um, going out to the dances with their silk stockings and, and their good shoes was uh, just what they needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. It was sort of, um, I suppose, like what times we've just been through, obviously you can't compare it to war, but like any sort of stress relief that you could 
could get because as they saying go you didn't know what was happening tomorrow so anything that you could go to the cinema go for a dance see friends you try to I think from everything I've ever read or talked to people you try to live life to the fullest as much as you could because you could didn't know what was going to happen I think those are uh, good words to live by then and good words to live by now and, mm -hmm. and maybe a nice place to uh, wrap up our conversation today. Uh, we'll, we'll encourage people to get in touch with us um, if they have any of those stories that we mentioned um, earlier. Rachel, how's, how, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you if they want to? Um, I have a website. It's Rachel with an E. Dot com because people always spell my name wrong and um, it's el instead of ael so rachel with an e i'm also rachel with an e on twitter on instagram so they're probably the best three places to, to find me and you will be sitting back waiting for all of these stories about uh women's land army and the, and the other services to roll in um it's been an absolute pleasure uh, talking to you and thank you very much for joining us. Um, something a little bit different for our podcast. It, it's not necessarily military history, but I, uh, I find it fascinating and hopefully others will too. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Subscribe to A Wee Bit of War on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favourite shows. That way you'll never miss an episode. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your co-workers break all the rules of the Official Secrets Act, and why not leave us a review to help others find the podcast. Thank you for joining myself and Rachel Sayers, and I look forward to your company again next time for another wee bit of war.